the thing about this room, the acoustics aren't brilliant and the microphones pop quite badly. So just, just a little warning, you might need to back off. <laughs> Anybody else come in and ask no. no. Do you want to start? Okay. Okay, thanks for joining us this morning. I know it's um, relatively early on a Saturday. Um, my name is Julie Pizzetti. I'm an Australian journalist and academic, um, and I've brought this panel together partly because of an association with um, UNESCO, which is the UN agency that um, deals in the defence and protection of freedom of expression, uh, which is essential to our work as journalists. Um, Guy Berger to my right uh, is the Director of Freedom of Expression and Media Development at UNESCO, and he's going to be speaking to you about um, a project that the UN has underway, which is seeking to um, help secure the future of the internet, and our job is to try to help them put journalism, I think, at the centre of that process. So I've got a really esteemed panel of people together to talk about um, some of the issues uh, at the core of this. Um, Guy, I've just shared your title, but do you want to say a little bit about yourself? Perhaps your connection to journalism would be helpful. Uh, thank you, uh, Julie, and thanks for organising this panel and the, the fantastic panellists we have. Uh, so I work at UNESCO, I've been there six years. And before that, I was a journalism educator and a journalist. So I think once you uh, have been a journalist, there's no cure for journalism. It stays with you your whole life. So uh, now that I've been at UNESCO, I, I've been trying to see what does the UN do about these kinds of uh, uh, issues about, of communications in the digital age, and in particular, uh, I inherited a system when I came to UNESCO of looking at indicators to map different countries, and I'll speak a bit about that, uh, to map countries' communications landscapes and then to propose changes to the governments and other stakeholders in those countries. So that's where this whole exercise comes in. Right. I might move to Sorry. Maria Ressa, to your right. Can you tell us a bit about yourself and um, perhaps just a, a sentence about um, you know, what the UN's role um, in, in terms of engaging with journalism as you've experienced it has meant. Um, so uh, I, I'm a, I've been a journalist for more than three decades, almost the eldest here, I think, even older than I know. Um, uh, I started a, a startup called Rappler in the Philippines, and uh, not to my, uh, I don't like the fact that we are now kind of at the forefront of the government's attacks on, on media in the Philippines, because uh, in January this year, uh, the government tried to shut us down. We're fighting it legally, uh, but the, we're trying to figure out whether rule of law exists. The UN and UNESCO has been incredibly um, pivotal for my own thinking personally as a journalist. These, these two actually helped me speak at the very beginning about the attacks that I was getting last year. Um, 98 messages per hour, and I just kind of, at one dinner, I said, Julie, this is happening, and I was keeping quiet about it, and then the two of them talked, and all of a sudden, it, I felt I had help. So that, that's great, and I hope that what we can do today is to take this and, and give as much help as I got to others who need it. Thank you. Okay, <clears throat> my name is Fatma Farag, and I'd also like to thank Julie and UNESCO for having this panel and for having me as a part of it. Um, I am an Egyptian journalist. I've been working for over 20 years as a journalist. I am currently the founder and CEO of a local media company, Wilad al Balad, and we are the only uh, media organization in Egypt focused on developing independent local media uh, across the country. So uh, particularly interested in that aspect uh, of media engagement uh, and empowerment. I'm also the regional director for Wan Ifra's Women in News program in the MENA region, uh, working to improve uh, gender parity uh, across newsrooms uh, in, in the Middle East and also with a component in, in Africa. I'm also a board member of the World Editors Forum. Uh, well, with regards to the UN, of course, the UN, uh, as, an, as an Egyptian journalist, as someone who's working to develop thematic journalism uh, within Egypt and specialized journalism, is a uh, very important um, sort of partner and stakeholder in, in allowing us and giving us the opportunity and, and sort of the resources to develop that type of work. Um, but also more specifically related to journalistic rights and rights of journalism, we've been active uh, in the campaign that was developed by UNESCO for against impunity against journalists, and this is a particularly important topic for those of us working in Egypt and in the Middle East region, and so that again has been an important framework to be involved in. Okay. And from CNN, is this one working? 
Wait, you this can one? have both. This one? <laughs> so, yeah, so I'm Inga Thorder. I'm the executive editor for CNN Digital International. And I guess the sort of my kind of um, different approach into this panel is this sort of global reach of CNN and the fact that we, um, you know, we've worked very much on the free and unfettered access to information globally, uh, which is a really big issue. So, um, you know, reading through this document and knowing that what the situation is in many countries and the access that those countries would have to our journalism um, is something that is really dear to my heart. So I'm really uh, pleased that we've managed to get this uh, panel together. Uh, good morning, uh, Raju Narisati. I'm the CEO of a group of websites called the Gizmodo Media Group, at least until 10 more days. Um, I've run newsrooms in uh, Europe, uh, Asia, and the US, and that's my kind of broader interest in this particular topic. I'm also um, on the board of the Wikimedia Foundation, which runs uh, Wikipedia, and access issues are really important in terms of thinking about um, free flow of information, and uh, something like this is very vital for that. Okay, great. So I'm going to hand to you, Guy, to tell us all about the project and what it means to this group of people. Sure. Let me get this mouse ready. Okay. So uh, th this is um, the way that uh, UNESCO is trying to figure out a tool whereby we can make sense of the internet at the country level. Of course, the internet's much wider than the country level, but it's, uh, it's the country level where some changes can be made, uh, hopefully to improve things. This model is based on these four principles, which we summarized as Rome, so it's very easy to remember. And the member states of UNESCO, which is 195, they all agreed that this is a good approach to, to understand the internet. It doesn't deal with all aspects of the internet. If we were the World Bank, we'd obviously be highlighting different aspects, but for UNESCO, we highlight these ones, which is rights, uh, openness, accessibility, and multi-stakeholder participation. So it's four principles. It sounds like a very nice model. Um, you know, it's sort of... Um, to use the Americanism, motherhood and apple pie. <laughs> I don't know whether that is uh, politically correct to say, motherhood and apple pie, but anyway. Parenthood and apple pie, probably, <laughs> or whatever you want. But uh, these, these are great principles. I don't think anybody can quibble with these principles, and I think uh, even governments that don't always uh, implement or respect these principles, they can't deny them because these are principles that are agreed now by all of them uh, in, in their collective uh, space at UNESCO. So uh, what's quite important about this is that the internet, if we didn't have these elements, we wouldn't have the internet as it is today. It has only grown up on the basis of a lot of these characteristics, um, maybe unevenly in different parts of the world, but fundamentally, this is what makes up the internet. And if you want the internet for everybody, for everywhere, you need to have these principles being really respected. How do you give these principles something that's a bit more powerful, give them a bit more teeth so you can really uh, implement them? Well, you've got to assess what does it mean on the ground. So multi-stakeholder participation, for example, which is fundamental to the design and the origin and the functioning of the internet. How do you assess our policies being made on a multi-stakeholder basis? What does it mean? In what places is it happening or not happening? So this is where the indicators come in. And it's based on this experience of the media development indicators that UNESCO has had for about 10 years. Media indicators, I'm sure you, it's very obvious to you, you would assess the legal area, uh, environment, the economic environment, technical environment, uh, capacity, and so on. And then you'd make recommendations to improve the media environment. And that's what's happened with these media indicators in places like Tunisia, uh, Jordan, um, in Latin America and a number of countries there, in different African countries, these indicators have been used for the media and they've really led to a lot of momentum for change because one, you have like a, a really evidence-based mapping of what the media situation is compared to international standards. And two, you've got the credibility of a UNESCO sort of stamp on this thing that the recommendations carry weight. So now today, of course, we live in a different universe. Uh, it's not just media as a system in itself. And that's what brings us to these new indicators, which um, if I could just uh, push this. So uh, 
left click, not the right click. Okay, so once we're parallel universes, so it's very easy, uh, uh, but uh, let me interact with you a little bit. Whoops, somehow it got cut off. Technical people, can you show that, uh, show the slide, please? We've lost connection, thank you. There we go. Okay, so which of these circles represents the, the media and which represents the, the internet? <laughs> okay, what color is media? Yellow. Okay. So once upon a time you had a small internet and you had a big media and then you had a bit of a, an overlap between them, the slightly shrinking media, uh, and now you have the media at the center, not the center, as, but squarely within this environment. Now this is really a fundamental change in the ecosystem and it means that basically what is happening in the internet is going to impact on the media, I mean like it or not. And I think you all there's some obvious things that we know about blocking, filtering, for example. I mean, these are fundamental to what's going to happen to media. It's not just blocking, filtering hate speech from some uh, group of extremists on the right. These are things, what if the media is reporting on ISIS? And that gets blocked, a media report on ISIS. So this blocking, filtering is really fundamental. I mean, now what's the, the broad regime for the internet has huge relevance to, the, to what's happening to, um, uh, to, to people in the media. More and more, of course, now we have the intermediaries, and their curation role is really becoming fundamental. People know that Facebook has chopped and changed over the past two years as to whether it's going to uh, put uh, uh, news media into the news feed or take it out the news feed. It's been experimenting in different countries. This is enormous. What Facebook is doing has huge implications for the survival and the, the visibility of, of media. So their curation role is something that's, that's big also. I'll turn to the question of cyber security or network security. What's this happening on the internet is also again huge for, for media. If you're a media outlet and you're being subjected to, to DDoS attacks and being knocked out, this is not just something that's happening to you in the media, it depends on the cyber security regime in the country and the preparedness of the country as a whole and the ability to deal with these kinds of issues. Um, then, of course, you come to the kind of cyber bullying, cyber intimidation that Maria Ressa has now. Of course, journalists are experiencing this probably more than many other people, and women journalists especially more, but there's a culture out there which is not just uh, impact on the media, it's a broader culture. So again, we're not gonna address the culture for the media, vis-a-vis -vis the media, without looking at the bigger internet e ecosystem. I'd also just give one last example here, which is one of the principles of this internet model is access. Now, access to the internet is really critical for access to media on the internet. The costs of access in a country affects, first of all, basically how many people are going to access media online. But as you may know, uh, probably you, you do, in developing countries, people use ad blockers. Why do they use ad blockers? Because when ads come through your system, it uses up your bandwidth, your airtime. So people use ad blockers, not because they're trying to block the ads, but because they're trying to reduce their data consumption. So you block the ads, and what does it mean for the media? So, you know, the overall uh, 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 affordability of the internet has got huge implications for the business model of, 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 of media. So these are just some examples about how this parallel universe has changed. I can tell you, I go to lots of internet conferences where people are discussing these big issues, and there's very few media people there, very few journalists. Um, and these internet people, some are keen on human rights and some are keen on connectivity and some are keen on access and some are keen on multi-stakeholder participation and intellectual property and so on, but they don't get the importance of journalism and media in this ecosystem. For them, it's just one of many things and it's not the interest. Fine. But unless the people who are interested in media, and news media in particular, and journalism in particular, unless people like this get involved, it's going to be an internet that moves at its own pace, in its own directions, and one of the casualties could be uh, journalism. So that's the kind of big picture, and why we are appealing you today is, is it's part of a consultation that UNESCO has been having for about a year on what do stakeholders think 
And so we've gone to a lot of conferences and had regional events. And again, not many media people participating. So now we are here in Perugia. Uh, Julie organized uh, an event uh, two days ago with uh, journalism educators. Thank you, Julie. And now we have some other people and we have some excellent uh, journalistic focused, passionate, insightful people here who can help UNESCO make sure that our indicators are going to really include the importance of journalism in this new ecosystem. So there are five categories, as you could, the four are OAM, and then there's some cross-cutting indicators. So I, I'll just give you a bit of a taste so you can see what they're about. Um, I have one more copy of the publication here, if anybody's just come in late and you'd like to get, um, get a copy. You've all got, okay. So uh, I, I'm, because you've got it, I'm not gonna go into detail, but for example, if you look at rights, rights is quite complicated because there's the right um, to information, there's the right to expression, there's the right to, when you expression, you're speaking about the right to impart information and the right to receive, which are two different dimensions, complementary right to association, uh, privacy, of course, you know, the right to be forgotten. There's also the right to reputation. All these things are vital, and how they're respected on the internet or not impacts on the role of the media in these things. Examples here is that do people, including media, have access to due process to, to address violations of rights? If, it's, if your rights to publish are being violated by the, the intermediary company, by the government, uh, by bullies and thugs, uh, mobsters online, trolls, what is your right to redress? These are important uh, questions. There's censorship, uh, which Inga was talking, speaking about, and so on and so forth. So um, I won't go into more detail here, but you can see the kind of issues that one would want to make a, a comprehensive uh, assessment of as to what is the situation and then what recommendations do you have in as much as national policies can improve this, this situation. More and more, as you know, governments are catching up with the internet, more and more governments are regulating. So part of this is to say, if this is gonna happen, let's try and get governments to do it in a way that respects international standards and is actually good for the country, not just good for the people in power. Openness, so openness, often people say we want an open internet, but UNESCO means this in quite a specific sense. So different, complementary, but different to, the, to the, 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 the human rights base. Openness here is about the openness of markets. It's about openness of technical standards. It's about the openness of content, because if you don't have this, you don't have the internet. So here, what's very important is, to what extent does a country have laws that will stop economic concentration? Okay, to what extent will the country have uh, some kind of dispensation that will uh, look at the independent management of the domain name system. Because if you want to set up a, a news website with a certain name and uh, it's being blocked by government, this is impacting on your ability to be an entrepreneur and have uh, uh, your, your, your registration there. If you look at the last one here, well, the second last one, net neutrality, obviously has a huge impact on, um, on, on, on the question of uh, openness and then ultimately on media. And access, uh, well, you know, if you don't have open data, uh, data journalism is basically a non-starter. You can't do data journalism without open data. Okay. The accessibility, it's a ROA. Accessibility covers, as I indicated earlier, things like affordability, local content, local language. So I'm not gonna go into detail here, but you can see those kind of things. There are some examples. Maybe I could just have um, uh, one thing here. Uh, let me highlight, um, say, number four, disabilities. Um, clearly, media people have an interest in media content reaching disabled people and including disabled people's concerns given the huge percentage of society that is disabled. So this, what, how accessible the internet is for disabled people becomes uh, an issue. Um, the second last one, the multi-stakeholder participation. So to what extent when the government makes laws that impact on the internet, like say in Europe, you have the right to be forgotten at the European Court of Justice. If a country is making a law, to what extent do they consult with the stakeholders, including media? Uh, that's national internet governance. Um, international, because the internet is international. 
Who's making these international policy decisions? Uh, examples here, well, I think that I, I won't spend time on that for now. The last one is cross-cutting indicators, which includes the gender issues, um, trust and security, children and young people, legal and ethical aspects. These don't fit easily into this ROAM framework, but they are really issues that uh, I think permeate throughout. Um, so for example, does a state have policies for gender equality? Because this impacts hugely on media, it impacts hugely on the internet. Um, what about intimidation? Uh, the abuse of the internet for intimidation. Are there policies that stop cyberbullying, which could be used for journalists to defend themselves uh, against uh, threats and so on? Uh, I've mentioned cybersecurity, and so number four is: is there a national, uh, 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 what's it, okay. cyber emergency response team, uh, CERT or equivalent? Okay, and so to wrap up, now what we really want to get from this consultation today is if there are any other themes, questions, or indicators that are of interest for you as media people, as people who care about journalism, that should need a special indicator, because a lot of these indicators are very relevant to what you do, but is there anything that's left out that could be, that should be added that will really make a specific assessment in a country? So what, uh, to, to wrap up, what we'll do is, at the, um, in the next few months, we will road test these draft indicators in, in a number of countries, and then we'll revise them, and then we present them back to the member states, and we say, you've got the concept, here's the indicators, do you agree to them? If they agree, then you've got an international standard about how to assess the internet, which sets the kind of um, bar for what the internet should be in a country. And then we, we, we find countries that are interested. I mean, we don't have uh, capacity or uh, resources to foist this on every country. Um, we've got to do it in cooperation, but they must be multi-stakeholder processes that govern the research using these indicators in a country. And particularly what's important is if you can get the governments involved in this, then governments are part of the process and the recommendations have a greater chance of being implemented. That's been our experience with our other indicators, and this is what we hope with the internet indicators. Voila. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and really important to get an understanding of how this relates to journalism, for the sake of journalism. Um, Maria Ressa, I'm going to get you to address this. I know it's complex um, material, but hopefully you'll take away the, the document <laughs> um, and uh, engage with it and share it and discuss it within your, your groups as well. But, Within it, you'll see, as Guy's outlined, um, are a range of themes, these Rome principles um, that he was talking about. Maria is going to address um, rights and cross-cutting issues, which uh, one of our academic colleagues the other day referred to as miscellaneous, and I think that's it's where the issues that, that cut across all of these other categories. Maria, what's your perspective? So I, I have, like, just three points um, uh, on it. Like, the first one, which I think we all pulled out, is um, what happens when you can't trust government? because uh, primarily the main actors are governments, right? And uh, while uh, the level playing field is supposed to be social media, well, social media is now in the power of, under the control of more authoritarian style government. So the first one is, how can we make this um, something that we can all use if we're not government? Um, the second is the concept of, of as journalists, we used to create information one by one. We still do. We have no choice. That still is I, I, the reason I, why I think journalism is critical to society, right? There is no more critical time uh, na than now for the mission of what we do. And yet, the flood of information that's come out, and Guy, you, you mentioned this a little bit, that in more of curation, but I think there's a, f there's a fundamental difference between the core content creation, the journalism, and then the ripple of that, which you would call curation. But So for me, it's looking at the impact of big data on our role as journalists and how governments have moved away from censorship, where they used to control what would come out when we were probably the number one and number two, right? You know, the yellow and the blue. 
um, now that it is the internet with little yellow journalists, um, the tool of choice for mo most autocrats and dictators to be is not to censor but to flood and to flood to the point of weakening uh, journalists, weakening institutions of trust, weakening trust, and then actually bashing the fracture lines of society because the, the mode of spread is social media. Anger spreads fastest on social media. So now that journalists are no longer the gatekeepers and we're actually getting, getting eaten up by the chaos theory and governments have learned that and are exploiting social media, um, who are the gatekeepers? You know, how, how, do we, how, how do you even begin to think about regulation or, or finding consensus? Like, we do self-regulation as journalists. We're pushing, um, we're pushing the platforms to do that, but is any of this um, possible? And then finally, the last one connects to the point of, of instead of Instead of censorship, you are flooding to the point of meaninglessness. It's that freedom of expression is actually being used to stifle freedom of expression. And the very principles here under freedom of expression are being used against journalists right, and against people. And the example I'll use for that is um, the drug war in the Philippines. In July of 2017, uh, we went from, you know, not that many people, we went from the drug war being started, uh, and when it began, you had an average of eight people killed every night. You know, our reporters would come back from that. And, and we would do the stories, but when it spreads on social media, anyone who questioned the killings would then be attacked. Um, and the attacks were vicious. So those people, what, they, what did they do? and that includes journalists, they quieted down. They stopped talking about their values. In fact, if you go um, online on Facebook, you would think that the values have transformed dramatically. And this is that moving line of how you transform and manufacture both consensus and how you transform the values at the basis of a society. So those are, you know, when, when the very tool that we're trying to use to protect is actually now used to subvert. Which is an incredibly powerful point and very difficult <laughs> as, a, as, a, as a challenge. Thanks very much, Maria. I'm gonna come back and um, unpack some of this with you uh, as we progress the discussion. But I wanna to move to Raju now, who's gonna to talk to us in the context of access and, and openness. And um, I, mean, I think we need to come back to this openness question um, because of the issues Maria's raised and, and others have, um, and perhaps re reimagine what that means. But give us your take, Raju. Yeah, so um, part of the challenge of having journalists or ex-journalists on a panel like this is that we typically tend to be very skeptical of efforts like this. Um, but I want to kind of push back against my own instinct as well, because I think something like this is very critical in terms of allowing third parties, if you will, NGOs or other organizations to use this as a framework to then actually kind of start thinking about how do we cross compare countries and how do we rank them. Uh, it is going to be challenging for UNESCO to get into the ranking business. But what they're providing, I think, here is a very important kind of a framework that allows others to kind of say, how does Zimbabwe compare against Malaysia? Or how does India do against Turkey? And using some of these um, principles around both access and uh, openness. And one of the fundamental goals here is to improve things, not just kind of criticize uh, the current status quo. And I think this goes a long way in that. I was, in, um, I was in India about a month ago at an event where the Vice President of India was there, and I cited um, the Reporters Without Borders annual ranking of press freedoms and pointed out to him that India is ranked 137th out of 188, which is kind of surprising that it's so low. But what I pointed out was that Afghanistan, where people actually die doing their jobs, is ranked 126th, much better than India. I'm like, Right there, there's some, you could disagree with the underlying principles, but right there, there's a problem in India that we, you need to address. So I think having these kind of benchmarks goes a long way in raising the awareness. But I want to talk a little bit about what happens um, 
as with all things UN and UNESCO, because of the multi-stakeholder thing, they take a while to become final reality. I think this is going to become reality in September, hopefully. Um, but I'm more uh, interested in thinking about, so what happens next? Uh, do we put out a report and walk away from it and let everybody else kind of figure out what to do with it? Or is there a way we can help organizations that are then applying this framework to countries to say, here are some things to watch out for, even though we are giving you a bigger framework, here's a good way to use it. And there are two or three examples that I want to uh, talk about that worry me a little bit. Um, I think the framework is comprehensive, but how do we reconcile the existence of laws or existence of a legal system with the reality of a law or a legal system? I'll give you an example. Um, Wikipedia has been like not accessible in Turkey now for 10 months, I think 11 months. You can't get it. The government just shut it down. So the normal, if you apply this indicator, you will say, okay, so Turkey has a, a legal system and laws, so Wikipedia could go to them, file a thing. But the reality of Turkey is, A, the courts are all now increasingly stacked by judges who are pro-government. But more importantly, this case doesn't ever come up. So having something on paper as a law, and then how does the judiciary act, and if the case never ever comes up, by this indicator, Turkey would have a check mark against having the right laws, but in practice, it would be failing it completely. So how do you reconcile that? And I think those are the kinds of things that are worth figuring out and helping third party organizations to kind of say, also think about these other practical issues in, in applying this framework. Mm -hmm. Very similarly, when you look at access and improvement, the idea of having a na national ID or database is a good thing, right? I mean, India is doing the world's largest biometric database called Aadhaar, where everybody's fingerprints, and it allows to, you to, on paper, take out corruption, have everybody have access to the same services, but at the same time, the data that's being collected and how well it's being protected and what's happening to it gives a completely different problem, even though India would rank very high on having access being open to a billion people. So I think things like that are worth focusing on to say that what do we do after September to make this much more robust in terms of its actual use cases. Um, I think oftentimes organizations tend to move on to the next thing. It will be important to kind of s not do that in this context because I think so much effort has gone into creating what's a really good framework, to maybe spend the next couple of years actually saying, you know, here are some practical things of how to use this and encourage others to do more rankings and cross-country comparisons. I think that would be a much higher uh, benefit of an exercise like this. Thank you. Great, thank you. Really practical and helpful. Um, Inge, we're going to come to you next um, with, a, with a focus on rights and openness. Yeah. Um, uh, so I think I think both uh, Roger and, and Maria have sort of pointed out the main uh, things that that I wanted to say too around that the accountability of nation states to monitor their own um, sort of actions is not working in so many parts of the world. So you know, so having a, a, na a national legal framework is not enough. So I think that you know the, the system that Roger was talking about, where you can at least sort of name and shame or, or rank countries, is. Um, a really necessary kind of uh, action to take and a motivator, you know, probably the strongest motivators that countries would have to um, to deal with uh, or, or wanting to at least appear higher in those things. I mean, you know, frankly, as, as, a, as a believer in the in the free internet and, uh, and access, I, I do think that there should also be some kind of um, a stick to go with the carrot, um, if in any way possible, although I know that um, that, that would be a sort of a hard sell. Um, I think that the other things that we kind of um, sort of I wanted to mention in parts of the rights issue is that they self-censorship is mentioned a few times. Now this is almost an impossible thing to measure. I mean if you are self-censoring in the first place, chances are that you're not going to come out and say I am self-censoring because you're doing it out of fear or you're doing it out of you know, I mean, it could sometimes be business reasons because you're worried that what, what's going to happen to your business. But on the whole, you are doing it for um, our, 
for negative reasons, should we say. So the measurement of how that, um, if you're doing that, is, is it, difficult. I mean, I think the other thing that is mentioned in a few places, and I think uh, one of them was um, around openness about how many people blog in each country. Again, it's lacking. What do you expect? What, 60% of the population to be blogging? 30%? I mean, I'm from Iceland where, you know, 90% of the people have published their own books, so they're probably all blogging as well. So what is the, where do you set the standards of, of what that is? So kind of giving people guidance of, we would expect this kind of an, or, or a minimum or a, a participation for this indicator to work. Um, so I think that's a, a, another one. Um, uh, I, there are a couple of things I wanted to mention around the, uh, the rights as well. Uh, one of them being a really big issue about privacy. Um, obviously, there's a very different approaches to this in the world. And I think that um, if there is some kind of document like this that could bring it all together about there's very strong privacy law coming in in the UK, in the Europe in, as a whole with the GDRP, you know, those rights aren't as protected in other parts of the world. Is there any way for us to kind of really realize, are these working? Are the European ones working? Are they a good framework for this? Mm -hmm. Are they, should we be looking at that? Or are other ways sort of better to be dealing with it? Um, and finally, just on openness, uh, Maria talks about them sort of flooding the internet and, and that's how they kind of deal with journalism. I also think that on censorship, instead of doing censorship, going into the, um, uh, in, into, media companies and, and censoring, which I, I, by the way, do believe that they're still doing in many places, they're, the way that countries deal with it is to shut down the internet itself. And there's a huge difference between just kind of taking Wikipedia off or saying, we will only give you access to a very small um, part of this internet. I mean, I once had the absolute privilege and pleasure of, of um, interviewing and speaking to Tim Berners-Lee and he compared the internet to a library and said, can you imagine if you went into a library and you could only pick three books, but you can see all the other ones, but you're not allowed to touch them. So I think that that was a really good sort of um, analogy of, of what the internet is. So you're, you're standing in this room, but you can't touch it. And um, so I think that this measure of, of, of shutting down access, not just to media, but information to, to rule out um, access to journalism is incredibly important. And then I, I did find it interesting, just as a sort of minor point, that you mentioned VPNs in the openness, which is a really um, interesting point. Um, but it uh, sort of fails to uh, look at that VPNs access can often uh, infringe copyrights as well. So I think that that's another thing. If you're using VPN for access to something in a different country, you're infringing copyrights. And I'm also a strong believer in copyrights, so there would have to be a, a, some kind of a protection for that. And, and just because Julie asked me to read this as a journalist, and I, <laughs> I did my editing like it was a, a <laughs> like it was a proper piece that was given to me by a, <laughs> by one of my journalists. I just want to make one point: is that it's not clear to me from the beginning what the stand is on it. I mean, is UNESCO what, what? what the stand is? It's like, is this supposed to be, I mean, it almost just needs a sentence in the beginning saying, UNESCO believes there should be free access to the internet. You know, I think it, it, the, the, the core message was a bit lost on me in the, uh, when I was reading okay. it. So um, I would have probably asked my, uh, my writer to go back and say, make this a little bit clearer for me. <laughs> they want a headline and a good, strong lead. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Thank you, Inky. Um, Farah, would you like to address the, the themes that um, you've been assigned? OK, well, uh, I approach this from a practitioner's point of view, so a journalist, um, not a specialist on policy. Uh, and for me, what struck me most is that we're talking constantly about governments. Governments are the ones shutting down the space and the ones that we need to sort of regulate around. But at the same time, when I'm doing business, often government doesn't really have to bother about that because business is shutting me down. The, 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 the business uh, algorithms and, and models that have developed around the internet uh, between the tech companies and the big platforms essentially make it very difficult for smaller organizations and smaller operators and independent ones to be able to be seen. So we're there, but if you can find us, you're lucky if you can because we don't have the resources to push content, uh, to show up on the search engines at the top of the list. You'd really have to scroll quite far down to be able to find us, not because that content is not important, not because it is not relevant uh, or, or highly controversial, but because we simply do not have the resources to push it. And if you don't have money anymore, then you really can't be seen 
uh, very well uh, within that space, and this has taken away this idea that the internet is an open space and a leveling playing field for all. And so um, for me, this is an essential point that should be sort of somehow dealt with uh, within the context of trying to create indicators that ensure that this remains a space or, or returns to becoming a space that uh, everyone can be seen in and have sort of equal representation within. So, and, and, and just um, when you were mentioning the domain names and how we manage that, it's, it's for in, in Egypt, the government isn't uh, making it difficult for you to buy a domain, but what happens is there's this business, people will buy up domains that they know you might take, and then they'll take the Facebook pages and Twitter accounts handles for that as well. And then if you want it, you have to approach them and buy it from them. And that is an inhibitor. So that's, uh, that relates to how business is, is managed, uh, not the government actually uh, going in and uh, shutting down the space. Uh, so regulations, perhaps, or indications around how uh, this business is managed. Um, and then this idea of the flooding. And of course, this happens in the intimidation uh, around that. And the, that is, of course, a, a very serious reality. Uh, but also, there is the fact that uh, people uh, go to what it is they think they want to see, and the internet uh, algorithms and, and, and modus of sort of operation supports that. And so, for example, if you look at the Middle East, you'll find that I think the first hundred most important uh, URLs will be religious uh, content sites, because this is what people are going to, and that and that also drowns out. Um, different perspectives, other views, uh, uh, independent journalism, and what have you. People are going to entertainment, are going to religious content, are going to sports, and, and, and the uh, algorithms are supporting that this is what they're constantly seeing. And what you're finding within the media industry as we go to all these different congresses that tell us how to deal with the constraints that we face in terms of business development is that now one of the keys is customization of content. And so as we further customize to be able to uh, beat the system, what we wind up doing is compromising all of that uh, independent journalism and other viewpoints that we need to get out there and that should be existent within this space uh, and, um, and make it a diverse uh, space. So, so there's that as well to think about and how that is impacting how also journalists do business. Uh, so it really increasing access to what? To which content and, and, and the importance of, of focusing on that. Um, uh, uh, the processes of how this comes together, uh, and uh, you were mentioning about you know the conferences and how journalists are never there. Perhaps part of the uh, the process is that the people from within the media industry who can actually make it to the conferences, who can afford to be there, who are represented within those rooms, are not necessarily the people who take this the most seriously, or understand it the best, uh, and are able to uh, actually make inputs uh, that would be relevant to this. And hence, maybe adjusting that process to ensure that stakeholders within newsrooms that can actually, and within the media ecosystems, that can impact are there. Uh, I think yesterday, Julie was mentioning that as this rollout is being rolled out, it will be tested within NGOs. Newsrooms function in a way which is very um, unaccepting, perhaps, of uh, the impact of that which comes from without them, uh, outside of them. So, uh, and you see this in different things, for example, in gender. And so, people from NGOs, from civil society, that come in with uh, agendas around gender, uh, equality, and parity, this is something that's considered not part of what it is that we do. It belongs to them, we might cover it, we might be interested, it doesn't impact the way we, as journalists, practice. So if you want to have, for example, a gender program that is impactful, you would probably want to start designing it within that space where, within which you want to see the impact. And I think the same argument is really relevant to this process as well. Right. Maybe part of it should not just be within civil society and government, but also should really include uh, practitioners of journalism from within their newsrooms. And that perhaps would impact that comment you were making about the document itself, and I think all of us maybe felt a bit um, alienated from when reading it and, and we needed to make an extra effort to sort of understand it, uh, even though it is extremely relevant to what it is that we do. And, and that maybe as it rolls out to a wider audience, especially within the journalist community, that um, you would think about the kinds of tools and the kinds of jargon and uh, that can be used within newsrooms and can impact them and be understood uh, by those people working within that sector. Uh, finally, I guess so that I don't take up too much Sorry, time. All right, <laughs> um, is the issue of the cross cutting? So uh, there were different uh, things that I took note of, particularly, especially for example, that which relates to culture content. Uh, and again, I'll relate this to my personal experience within Egypt, uh, and we work with um, different. Uh, we work in cultural heritage conservation, so we have a bit. 
there are budgets that are allocated by government to the Ministry of Culture and to the various bodies for internet content and media awareness around this. These budgets either remain unspent or they are used to develop content that no one is ever going to look at, simply because they do not you know, adhere to what it is that people will look for uh, when looking on the internet. And so here's really the issue of capacity. So you can have a government that will check that, that they actually did that, they did allocate, they did think, they did uh, take measures, mm -hmm. but they didn't develop anything that would actually be impactful. And so perhaps also focusing on that uh, and thinking about really the capacity uh, of local governments in being able to implement that and who the relative partners would be uh, in making that a reality um, uh, is something also to, to include in that. And then finally with the media literacy, and I, that relates to, again to the capacity development. And for example, again, we work with local schools. There are budgets allocated by the Ministry of Education to these schools to do media literacy training. Uh, they don't know how to spend it, uh, and this is a big, big problem. And and it just it, it just shows you where the resource can be available and just not used. So again, how can this be included into the parameters to ensure that it's not just ticking that box that the resource is there, but that actually we're able to implement it and in a way that is meaningful. Thank so you. May, may I quickly jump yeah, in yeah, on absolutely. one point? Um, it's a very important point where what looks like a positive indicator can often be a negative indicator as well, and that's important to... Uh, so the idea that government allocates funds for development of media or news literacy at all on paper is a good thing, right? But the reality in a lot of countries is that same fund or the ability to support media can be used in a very powerful way to make sure there is like censorship without saying it. I mean, India is again a good example where the Indian government is the largest single advertiser for all newspapers. That gives them so much unsated power to be able to say, you know, maybe we will pull advertising from your brand to go to a different brand. And I think so it's important to kind of always flag that what might look like a positive indicator, worth checking if it can turn into a negative indicator. It's almost like A-B testing your indicators, <laughs> the positive and negative. Okay. Great, thank you. Some really rich feedback there, and really, I think you would agree, important feedback. And I might start with that point, um, we'll go in reverse order. I'm gonna get Guy, without notice, to, <laughs> to respond to some of the, um, the points that, that you've made. Um, and let's start with a point that, um, that Fatima made, which is, um, I think it has to be acknowledged, the fact that this process has been going on for a year, and this is probably the first time um, at this conference that there's been active direct engagement with working journalists. Is that a fair critique about um, these sorts of processes? And if it is, how do you respond to uh, Fatima's suggestions around ensuring that these issues that are fundamental to the sustainability of journalism get active traction among the journalists working in the world, not just the NGOs representing them? Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, uh, first of all, I just want to thank everybody for, for really uh, thought-provoking and stimulating comments, and um, I will uh, take the, I've taken six pages of notes, so <laughs> I definitely would take this really seriously. In terms of your challenge, Judy, I think that these, in the nature of this thing, it's, this is not a popular uh, kind of uh, research instrument that you know is for for each and every single stakeholder to sort of you know get into the nitty gritties. For example, uh, Inga was mentioned you know, VPNs, which is an indicator. But I don't know even here amongst journalists, how many journalists even know what is a VPN? So it is a certain level of expertise that is required, and there is a certain level of jargon because it's the UN and because it's. In the end, this thing is also, uh, it's got to be used in countries by people who can do the research under the guidance of a multi-stakeholder committee. So it's not a document to speak directly to, 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 to everybody, put it that way. And at the same time, uh, we've also got to uh, develop this at this stage uh, as something that will be in the, the discourse of the member states, which is the diplomatic kind of terminology and so on. Uh, when you come to implement it, then it should be, you know, a, a bit more popularized and, and people should be involved and there should be focus groups involving lots of different actors, including the newsroom people and so on. And then the report itself, 
that comes out of the application in, a, in whatever country you, you're talking about, that report has got a lot of potential to be used in very popular forms to say, you know, recommendation one, there should be <laughs> a, a assessment of budgets, uh, how they're spent uh, of internet content, you know, uh, Okay, that's a bit boring, but you could, you, know, you could turn into a popular kind of tweet or, or meme even, uh, one point that comes out of the report and then build a campaign around that if you wanted to. So I think we, we shouldn't... Uh, okay, I think I'll stop. I've made my point. <laughs> okay, no, but I, I think that, I'm sure that's a point you'll take away around the direct engagement of journalists mm. at this stage of developing the very indicators that you then plan to road test. And this has, I think, been very useful um, from my observational position in that regard. So thank you <laughs> for a range of inputs. Um, Inga, uh, to your point, um, I think on, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, because there were so many great points, Guy was taking notes, I'm very glad. Um, <laughs> standards, minimum standards was something that I think you said. Um, so Guy, what, what, what is your um, reaction to that? It's a, it's a great idea that in, in having an indicator that you want people to measure against with a, a variety of test points, do you provide some sort of, sort of guidance notes that are kind of examples of um, positive implementation which might also get to Raju's concern around the flip side of, a, of an indicator? Yeah, this was a challenging point that Inga raised with a particular example, but what is the optimum um, minimum number of, of percentage of the population who actually take advantage in blog? And I guess one could probably, depends what you mean by blog, because everybody on the Facebook uh, page is putting up some content. So, you know, we, we need to kind of try and, I think, think, we need to think a bit more about this. Um, but I also think that countries are different, so you have to be a bit careful, because what is possible in some countries is not possible in other countries. And not only that example um, with, you know, how many people have access and can blog and have, are literate and so on and so forth, but even things like, is there multilingualism on the internet? Uh, in some countries this is extremely relevant, in other countries it's much less relevant. So it's hard to kind of have an absolutely universal kind of say. The, ideally, you know, every country should have, you know, this sort of thing. I, I think um, just one idea on that is that it can also be tied to literacy, you yeah. know, because... If you expect certain literacy in each country and, and the access, then there could be some correlation you can between the two. To the country, yeah. sure. Okay, and Raju's um, point around reconciling reality um, with the ideals of, of an indicator, what, what was your response to that? So the fact that you yeah. might have useful uh, mm. guidelines and, um, and principles and indicators, but uh, in reality the, the impact or the outcome yeah. is, is quite distinct. Well, I, I think uh, it's a, also a wider point you made that, you know, it, it's contested because uh, different actors want to come out looking good on this, you know, whether it's the big in internet companies, whether it's the government, whether it's this ministry or that ministry, or even civil society, you know, everyone would like to use these indicators. And, and it is contested. And I think what's really important is that the indicators should not make it easy for one group to tick a box and kind of like, well, you know, like we find no, rec no, no improvement needed because everyone can actually improve. And so it's a way of trying to formulate those indicators, first of all, in a way that, that uh, puts emphasis on the, the implementation, not just the... But, but uh, I would say that uh, sometimes, uh, well, in most cases, to have a, a law is at least a starting point. Um, because if there's no law, then it's un more, less likely you will have implementation. You can have a law and no implementation, but you know, your starting point is law. But we need to go further. And then I think it's also very much in the implementation of these indicators stage that uh, when you have a multi-stakeholder kind of advisory board monitoring the research process to really hammer and say, we've got to go deep, deep, deep into the implementation of a law. Um, not just kind of, yes, the law meets the standards, uh, what does it mean actually on practice? So that's kind of a, almost a phase two, I think. Uh, one phase, get the indicator right and point to, to not just the standard, but is it being you know, applied properly, but then when you do the research, to go deep as well. Okay, great, and continue that discussion. Do you want to say something in response? Yeah, I mean, a little bit more of an omnibus question here, Guy, which is that, what is the definition of success for this project, right? And then maybe we can work back from there. Is it it's September getting most or all member countries to say, okay, we sign off on this. Is that success or are there more things that you will say 
we come back, I don't know, three years out back here, mm -hmm. have a panel and say, so what has happened? I'm curious about how you think about that. Well, uh, there's different uh, uh, successes. I think the number one success is uh, we get unanimous endorsement of the member states that this is an international standard for assessing the internet and that countries should try to live up to the standard. That would be number one. Number two, then we can start implementing the research process using this in a number of countries. We can't do all countries because not some countries you know, but they don't want to do it or there's not enough resources or whatever, but to do it in some countries and actually then say it made a difference. That actually it led to the change in policies on the part of the platforms, for example, or it led to a change on the part of uh, the education system, the media information literacy, or it's, it, it made it, uh, the government made a commitment then to not cut the internet, uh, the, the case that Inga was. So if we can check those, I think what's also important with these kind of indicators, and here I'm kind of maybe on thin ice a bit, but to come back after a few years and do it again in the same country and say, okay, well, nothing's happened or there was progress or it's gone backwards. Uh, now, of course, why, why I say I'm on thin ice? Because who knows, the internet may be so different, these indicators yeah. could be not so relevant in, in, in three years' time. But anyway, at least for the start. Uh, so th I think those are the, the, the kind of successes that you know, we would like to see. This thing is really useful. It's, it's agreed, it's taken up, at least to improvements at, at, uh, at country level. I guess that goes to the point that you were making too, which again, the thin ice um, analogy, but it, this is all changing so incredibly rapidly. Um, do you have a process where you revise the indicators uh, regularly after this? <laughs> Um, it's, Sorry, uh, we, we certainly need it, but, uh, we, <laughs> we, but, but, but we don't have a... Okay. Uh, at this stage, we're just trying to oh, finish no, the consultations, <laughs> get them road tested, get them approved, <laughs> try them in a number of countries as fully-fledged uh, indicators. Okay. Julie, don't try to give the guy more grey hair. <laughs> <laughs> um, finally to Maria, and I'm afraid it is, it is going to cause the grey hair to get greyer. Um, but it's the really difficult uh, questions that Maria has, has posed around the, the weaponization of freedom of expression and openness against freedom of expression and the practice of journalism. I mean, this is, this is an observation that I've heard other people make here, although not specifically in that manner, but the, the way in which uh, what we believed would be so uh, valuable and democratizing and, and, and sort of ensuring the security of journalism into the future is now being turned against so much um, of journalism's core role. What do you do about that? I mean, you're the director of freedom of expression at UNESCO. What does it mean when states are weaponizing that? And I, I realize I'm putting you in a difficult situation, but answer that as much as you feel you have the capacity to. How do you address it with the indicators? I don't think we've probably addressed it clearly enough, but um, I, I think most people can agree, and certainly in terms of international standards, not all expression is protected by freedom of expression. If you're going to incite uh, hostility, discrimination, or violence, you're not protected. So I wouldn't call that a use of freedom of expression. That is a, a violation of freedom of expression. In fact, it's, uh, it's, it's legitimate to restrict those, res those kinds of expressions. So those kinds of expressions, you know, uh, uh, certainly one, one doesn't see that as the freedom of expression that you want, uh, that you would recognize uh, on, on the internet. Um, there is a grayer area of, um, of the flooding, which the flooding at the moment includes you know, illegal expression, as it were, but it includes also just... Propagandistic. Yeah, just... Exponential lies. Yeah, <laughs> uh, you know, I, I mean, not all... Uh, it's not, uh, in terms of international standards, it's not illegal to, to lie. I mean, you know, it's... <laughs> you, you can't lie, you, can, you can't exaggerate. In some countries so, it's becoming illegal, false news, for example, or legislation. Well, uh, uh, yeah, but uh, would, uh, I mean, that raises a whole lot of other issues. Indeed. But uh, at any rate, um, so how does journalism stand up against disinformation which does not cross the threshold of, in, of, of intimidation for hostility, mm. discrimination and violence? So um, that, that, is, that is a really big challenge to, to you know, how are you going to make a distinction you know, uh, between these, these two or get some sense of pro what is the proportion of, of bad stuff. <laughs> and, uh, but I think the remedies are different, that's what I'm saying. The, the one, the one remedy is well, the states have an obligation to stop uh, you know, hate speech in this particular defined way. And, and uh, in fact, uh, you know, this is a nice international 
covenant civil and political rights, uh, if, you, if you look at that, that they are supposed to actually take action against that. And there are some UN mechanisms that can be approached to kind of try and get compliance on this, like the UN Human Rights uh, uh, Council and the UN, UN, UN Human Rights Committee, two related bodies in, in Geneva, uh, because states have obligations. The other stuff, um, that becomes, I think there are different remedies that, that are required now. So part of it is in the, what recommendations do you make coming out of the, these assessments? But uh, uh, coming to this point also that um, what do you do when you know, the, a government is really you know, involved in, in you know, trying to, in this big internet arena, trying to kind of shrink independent journalism even, even more or even push it out? Uh, and uh, to be honest, uh, I don't think these indicators are going to change uh, a, a huge amount there. But uh, uh, Roger made a very important observation. Uh, and Inga, actually, I think about the role of third parties and the role of naming and shaming and so on. This is not something that um, the UN will do in terms of its, its intergovernmental body, uh, you know. But the kind of data that's produced is available for society and third party actors to, to advocate on. And people, uh, I think, should also, this is, this is a tough thing to say, but you're not going to get the UN to sort out the problems, even with the UN with the Security Council, they can't sort out the problems in a given country. Ultimately, you can use international stuff up to a point, and these indicators can do it up to a point, but it's got to be your local stakeholders who've got to drive change. I, I'm sorry, but you, know, you, you just don't get social change from the outside in, in a country. You, and it can support. And central to that, right? I mean, that's in terms of applying... Yeah, and international solidarity with journalism is absolutely a critical concern, but unless journalists themselves are mobilised within their country to try and fight for the values, whether it's through using this kind of instrument or many other things, you know, you, you can't expect a, a society to advance if it's uh, just from outside, uh, outside pressure. Let me pause for a moment. We have about um, five minutes for questions. I'm sorry, we've, um, there's, there's a difficult issues to unpack. There's been some really important contributions there, I think. But does anybody in the audience, um, any of the stakeholders in the audience, have a, um, have a comment or a question? Yeah, Mira up the front. Hi, Mira Salva from the Reuters Institute. Thanks. Um, kind of from a journalistic background, the one thing that struck me was something you touched on, content. What, what kind of journalism do we want to promote via this and there is very much an issue like you said of you know information that's licensed by the media governments in a way you know good journalism that you think people ought to know about say education or food security but how do you get people to read it engage in it it's mm -hmm. not just about putting the information there it's yeah. also about the shoe leather reporting you know making it interesting exactly. informative and you know I'd like to know more about that and um, the idea of citizenship, because I think we've been having this idea of you know, what it means to be a citizen in the age of platforms. Yeah. And I think that's something that could go into this almost as kind of call to arms, like this is an opportunity to define what it means, what we as citizens of these countries want out of the media. And you know, in, in, instead of the language of human rights, which can be, um, you know, it can be, some governments can just say, well, this is going to be yet another stick to beat us with. But if you talk about talk to your citizens rather than talk mm. to them in the framing of human rights, you might have access to governments like, I'm just thinking, governments like Singapore, Singapore for example. Yeah, yeah. Which will accept, but digital citizenship. In a yes, way, they'll accept yeah. the idea yeah. of digital citizenship, less yeah. so human rights. Yeah, an interesting point. Did you want to say something in response to that or move to a question? Well, I just give one, uh, I think it's, they're, they're great points. My, just one concern is that the discourse of citizenship can often be copped into national citizenship, and uh, then young people are not included because they, they're not legal age citizens, and of course migrants and refugees are not included. So we need to be a bit, depending how you define it, yeah. Yeah, good points. Anybody else have a question or a comment? Yep. And then I'm going to ask you, Guy, um, to, um, to just summarise your, your key takeaways just to wrap up. Okay. Or key takeaway. <laughs> What kind of role do you have for opinion in putting this together? Uh, I, I, I get the sense that when people talk about journalism, we're, we're talking about reporting, uh, 
but there is a a big space that uh, opinion journalists uh, occupy, and I think it's it's something to celebrate. Now we're, we're looking at the continuum of, of, of opinion. We can bring in the voices of bloggers and and, and so on and so forth. I'm just wondering uh, in this. Uh, set of indicators you're putting together mm -hmm. to come up with a map and so on and so forth. What, um, how is opinion uh, yeah. shaping up? You know, it's not, uh, we haven't gone into that uh, detail, but broadly, I think uh, at UNESCO, the view is that uh, journalism includes verified information in the public interest, like okay, news, and informed comment. Because anybody can comment, but journalistic comment should be informed comment, and also in the public interest. So um, it's sort of it's it's a broad thing. Now, journalistic comment can be done by many actors, but it, it's it's thoughtful comment. It's not just kind of I like this or I don't like that. It's, <laughs> it's, I disagree. Yeah, Full yeah, stop. yeah. It's it should be based on some journalistic uh, methods of actually, you know, you know. Uh, comment based on evidence, based on verifiable evidence, comment based on international standards, comment says, uh, that deals with public interest issues. That's, I think, what distinguishes journalistic comment. Whether it's done by bloggers or, or a Facebook post, it, uh, that's, that's not uh, the issue. But it's, it's, uh, it's just different to the kind of knee-jerk uh, instant response of you know, a Vox poll. It's probably worth noting that, I mean, UNESCO and other UN agencies don't necessarily define what a journalist is, but what an act of journalism is effectively. So what is journalism, which, which does incorporate journalistic acts done by a range of different people. Yeah. 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 Um, so Guy, if you could just um, share with us perhaps one or two of your um, top of mind takeaways from this session, what stood out for you? Well, I really appreciate the very concrete comments of people from, you know, speaking right from their, you know, where they are, and, and uh, you know, that's, it's very sobering, because in the UN, it's, you know, we operate at this high level of international uh, kind of standards and so on, and you hear from people on the ground, what's it like in Egypt and Philippines and uh, the, the CNN experiences and what Raju was saying and coming also from Wikipedia. So getting that concrete stuff, I think, is, is really... It's, it's sobering, but also very helpful, because in the end, these indicators should be assessing exactly this kind of level of reality and coming out about ways in which different actors can improve uh, their, according to their roles, their responsibilities, their possibilities. Um, so I, I think this helped to root things um, in that experience. And again, I would just say that we're dealing with a very wide uh, system which is not just about information and communication now, it's about commerce, it's about warfare, it's about uh, you know, um, all kinds of um, transportation and artificial, you know, it's like a growing, growing, com complexifying ecosystem. And within this, still journalism is so important and we've got to try and make sure that whatever we do vis-a-vis uh, -vis this ecosystem that's impacting on, on, on so many different dimensions that journalism does get protected and respected and can play a, the kind of role that society needs because really with, without journalism, I, I mean, I think there's the idea of moving forward to achieve these great sustainable development goals, people will be, societies will be moving in the dark because it's only journalism that can really provide the kind of uh, the light that's needed. Um, because everyone else is providing heat, but journalists are, should be providing the light. Thanks, that's an inspiring comment Thanks. on which to end the discussion. But just before I do close, um, uh, this is a study that I did for UNESCO under our guy's leadership called the Protection of Journalism Sources in the Digital Age. Um, I've got a few copies here and I'm mentioning this because within it is a set of 11 indicators, if you like, around allowing the assessment of um, the protection of source confidentiality and to an extent whistleblowers within a state. So it's like a, a mini, very mini version of, of um, the exercise that's underway here. And one of the uh, recommendations or one of the indicators was around um, uh, ensuring that journalists have the capability to deal with uh, whistleblowers and confidential sources securely. As, as a response to that, in part, um, an NGO called Blueprint for Free Speech is working with OSF to try and develop um, guidelines for journalists working with whistleblowers. I'm a panel, on a panel this afternoon talking a bit about this with this man here. I think it's at two o'clock, um, and we're using a, a roundtable at, UNES, at UNESCO, at 
the International Journalism Festival here in Perugia to try to um, get some traction around what these guidelines look like. So I think that gives you an example of what concrete action could ultimately emerge. So if anyone wants a copy of this, please come and take it. And it's free to download, download I can't speak anymore, um, <laughs> via the, the leaflet you have. Thanks so much for coming. It's, it's really important intervention and I'm grateful for you being here. Thanks. Thank you.